Hello and welcome to Surveyor Says, the podcast from the National Society of Professional Surveyors. Each week, we bring you fascinating guests that are involved in the profession of surveying. We cover a lot of ground, including Table Lay Talk with Gary Kent, Point of Order with the NSPS Joint Government Affairs Team, Future Focus, highlighting current and future leaders of the profession, and everything survey-related in between. Thanks for joining us here on the podcast, and hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Surveyor Says. Welcome to Surveyor Says. This is your host today, Kurt Sumner. Always a pleasure to be able to present new and interesting things for our audience. And today, my guest has information that every surveyor is interested in. Pretty much everywhere, I would say. Maybe if all of your work is done where there's nothing but big buildings and concrete, this may not have much application for you. But that's not likely to be the case because all of us in surveying are, as we often say, first in, last out. So we're going out there to def help define people for people where their property lies. And then whatever happens all the way through, if it goes to construction and whatever, then we're the last guys out. We have to identify what it looked like at the end with an as built. So for that beginning part, my guest today is Steve Allison. Welcome, Steve. Yeah, thank you for having me. And and I I will let him define for you what his title and job is, but the hint is we're going to be talking about tree and plant identification. Because any of us who have ever worked in the woods know that that isn't an easy task and Steve has that's a lot of knowledge and has developed some some good ideas about how to help you do that. So with that, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, we'll just go from here and, and have our conversation. Sure, that sounds great. Uh, yeah, my name is Steve Allison. Uh, I'm a landscape architect. I'm an ISA certified arborist, track qualified, and I've been practicing in the reforestation and restoration field of landscape architecture for about 12 years now. And I am the environmental project manager at Rogers Consulting. Uh, last year and this year, I put together a presentation for um, the uh, surveyor conference that I've gone to, uh, going over methods on tree identification, not necessarily talking about which tree species and what to identify and the characteristics of them per se, but the methods on, the methods and approaches that we need to look at while we're walking out in the field. And so it's slightly a different approach, but that's what I'd like to talk about today uh, and kind of go over why I developed what I did with this walk in the woods presentation. Well, we're excited to hear about it. I know I am. Um, as we talked about before we got started, that's one of the things that it's almost like some people really are good at it and some people aren't very good at it. Um, and I think it's like everything else, though. Uh, practice makes perfect, right? And so you have to have to learn enough to know what to look for. But then the more you do it, the better you're going to become. And that's true for surveyors, too. You know, we hopefully we get better as we as we work longer. So, um, well, yeah, that's that's what I've noticed. And one of the issues that I found uh, when starting out out of school and why I created the, the presentation and the discussion uh, was that, you know, looking at a single leaf or a, a blown up picture of a branch or a bark really didn't tell the story of what you would see when you walked into a forest. And I learned that quite quickly when I came out of school. I had a project up in uh, New York City and um, I was it was right in the winter and we had to identify all the trees prior to virus. Verrazano Narrows Bridge. And uh, when you come out of school, no matter how good your dendrology classes are, they are academic. And uh, going out there and, you know, right in 2008, trying to figure out what species were along a highway with no leaves, I realized there must be a better way. <laughs> uh, so I started taking pictures of everything that I could and look for individual characteristics that I saw that went beyond the books 
uh, that could help me identify trees when you have bittersweet vines and poison ivy vines everywhere. You can't even get near the tree and you might only see 20% of the tree. What little identifiers can I find that I can quickly uh, figure out which tree it is when the branching that I'm looking at for opposite or alternate is 20 feet off the ground and there are no leaves on the tree. How do you do that and, and be successful in your career and, and, and move quickly through the forest? Uh, so a couple of things that I started figuring out before I would go out is understanding the area that you're in. If you're in a lowland upland area, if you're in a coastal plain, if you're in a Piedmont area, uh, you can start reducing your list of, of trees that you might see on a project before you even go there. And it's, it's more of a desktop analysis. And I started to do that and do prep work to make sure I didn't have every tree running uh, like a Rolodex in, in my mind. So narrowing that down and then looking at different identifiable features that I saw consistently out there that uh, were in the upper scaffolding branches or the lateral branches that would help me identify that. So it, it was almost to the point that I kind of retaught myself what a tree looks like based on what I see in the forest and not necessarily the arboretum and along the street. A, a red maple that was planted 10 years ago along a road is much different than a 10 to 15 year old red maple in the middle of the forest that's been reacting through phototropism and geotropism trying to survive. And the same thing with different abiotic and biotic disorders that it may get, your texture to the bark is, is going to look significantly different. When you were talking about the uh, taking the photographs, um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, did, did you then take your photographs and create for yourself some type of uh, photo album or whatever that you could use later on? when you came into a similar situation where was it helpful for that? Well, I did, uh, I would, you know, in the age of computers, I would have different folders of every time, every time I'd be out with a red maple and I'd go out with a senior LA or a senior surveyor. And, uh, every time we'd see one, I'd take a picture of the bark, the structure and a picture from directly beneath the tree, straight up at the canopy. And I'd start studying the structure uh, of each tree. Believe it or not, they have different structures. Uh, every tree has a much different scaffolding structure. Uh, and I started noting when I would see lateral branches having arches on, on the end of them of younger branches. I would take all the different photos and line them up. So in my head, I had all the different scenarios of what a red maple would look like in all different situations instead of that one photo that you got from Google. Uh, that made a huge difference in finding those identifiers uh, that that I'd be looking for. Um, one of the trees that is one of the the straightest trees in the woods, and if once you know it, you know it. But uh, the tulip poplar. Uh, one of the difficult things that I was having is when you're in the woods with tons of different trees, and you have briars and shrubs and honeysuckle everywhere, and you don't get that close to the tree. How do you identify those lateral and scaffolding limbs when that's all you can see? Uh, the um, tulip poplar, the lateral branches will arch out at like a 45 degree angle. That started to be when I was in very dense invasive forest, the thing I needed to look, look for. And then I would go to the next tree knowing that I only see that characteristic in that tree. And I haven't found that in a book, but I repeatedly see it in the forest. Um, and that saves me time knowing that I have a 45 degree angle arch on a mature lateral branch of a tulip poplar. I move on. Uh, so, and there's many other cases with, uh, with trees. I get questions all the time um, with knowing uh, oak trees. And one of the big issues with oak trees is if you're in the middle of the woods and it's winter and you have a black oak tree and a red oak tree, and those are the two you're trying to figure out what it is and you're moving your feet, you know, through the, through the leaves, trying to figure out a, uh, you know, which leaf this tree goes to. Those leaves look similar. Oaks hybridize. And I started figuring out the, the bark of the oaks are, are much different. And some people uh, pass by that. They look for the buds and the alternate or opposite or just the leaf. And the bark is very telling along with the scaffolding structure. Um, 
a black oak will, if you have a pen knife with you and you just chip at the bark a little bit, it will have a orange inner bark. So that if you don't even know anything with a characteristic, you can do that test. You're not going to get that with a red oak. But the, the red oak has such, it looks like white long striations coming down mature bark. Where black oak, it's, it's much more smooth, tighter furrows, uh, and actually the bark kind of breaks off into irregular blocks. So many people don't look at that necessarily, and they're looking for the leaf or the branching, and that's too hard to see in, in the forest. So just that breakdown of that uh, changed everything. I didn't even need to know too much more about the oak tree except looking for that pattern on the bark. And, and that made me jump right to the next tree after that. It, it could be a scarlet oak or different things like that, but we're not necessarily botanists out there. We just need to get it, you know, as close as possible. And oaks hybridize. So if I get it close to a red or close to a black or a white or a chestnut, we're, we're in pretty good shape on that. So obviously you have a background where you, you went to school to do this. You've been working in it. You've developed your, your library. Uh, obviously, for the most part, I'd say most surveyors are not going to have that kind of resource at their uh, at their disposal. Um, you have any tips? I mean, I know you've already given some tips there, but um, without having the the background knowledge like you do or having had the advantage of collecting uh, photographs is the best. Uh, the best option to maybe work with someone who's has your knowledge. And I guess maybe it depends on uh, why they're locating the trees. What's the purpose? Uh, you know, is it going to be a development? Is it a boundary marker? Whatever. I mean, I, th I think the best tips that I could give that I gave in the presentation is, is really just um, go out, learn your area and then, understand the basics of bark structure and branch structure before you go out. Uh, a lot of the trees, when, when I first started and I came to Maryland, I'm not originally from Maryland, I went out on the weekends and just took pictures and figured it out when I got home. And uh, so I didn't really go out too many times with somebody that knew everything, uh, but, but basically researching it myself and taking pictures each time I'm out made, made the huge difference. Uh, I think just not narrowing yourself down to the leaf and, and the, uh, the, the, the opposite or alternate branching, because when we go into forest, we, we can't see that stuff. So looking at the tree more as a sum of all of its parts and finding the patterns for the trees that, uh, that, that work best for you. So if you go out and you don't know any trees, the first one you grab, you know, take a picture of the bark, take a picture of as much as you can, and then, uh, you know, find what's closest to that in a book. And you're, you're probably going to get pretty close. Uh, but having somebody senior there is, is pretty valuable. But if this is your career, you're going to go out multiple times. So understanding, looking at the things that people don't typically look at in trees, um, the color of leaves is something I would I talked about in, in the presentation as well, where I do the, the walk in the woods and I give photos from, you know, 200 yards away. I'm, I'm walking up to a forest stand and I'm already thinking what far, what, what a tree I'm going to see in there, uh, which trees are in front of me. And I look at the color of the leaves, the darkness of the leaves, uh, the, the shape that the, the tree makes because of the leaf structure. If it's a bipinnately compound leaf where it has multiple leaflets, or if it is as big glossier leaves, I'm already starting to break down what trees could possibly be that. Uh, so, so instead of just thinking about trees having green leaves and brown bark, look at it a little bit, little bit more intimately and, and notice that there's slight variations. And, and then you can start making your list of what you see out of that uh, red oak compared to a um, slippery elm or the structure of the tree and start paying attention to those. Cause I, I think those are probably more valuable than, um, than branching structure or um, stem structure and, uh, and leaves. So I think if that's what I'd want to drive home is looking at the other characteristics actually make it a bit easier to identify the tree. 
if I remember correctly from the from the workshop, I think you made a comment about being out there in different seasons of the year. Yes. Yeah. I actually find that winter is the best time to identify a tree. Uh, you don't have all the invasives. You don't have high brush that you're walking through. And each tree has a different characteristic with its branching. Uh, you know, you're going to get more of a vase shape out of an elm and you're going to get more of a, you know, um, uh, less less of a uh, um, central central stem in a, in a red maple than you would see in other trees. Uh, I think that's the best way to start identifying is the winter, because once you break down and figure out what those structures are of the most common trees you see, the summer is no issue. You're not scrounging for things that you can hardly see up in the canopy. Uh, so identifying trees through their structure is is probably if you're thinking long game of, of your knowledge for this for this one aspect of your job is surveying, getting that down first uh, will will pay dividends in the future for you. So I assume that I've I've been a surveyor on the East Coast my entire life, Virginia, Maryland, a little bit in North Carolina. Um, but I, I guess these underlying principles are the same no matter where you are. The trees are different, sure. but the principles are the same, I would assume. Yeah, and I would say exactly uh, knowing your region and uh, knowing the type of dominant trees, like we have oak hickory forests in this area, you can usually break down what, how many trees you'll actually have in an area. It usually comes down to four to six dominant species, and then you may have two to four invasive species on the periphery. Uh, you know, when when I go out and look at different areas, uh, usually if there's a cut from a different parcel or whatnot, I know that I'm going to find an invasive understory probably within 30 feet of that forest edge. So when I'm starting to look at young growth that's going through there, I immediately think about, I, I, I go through my invasive task list, you know, of, of tree names. And, and I'm able to start now focusing on only three trees I'd probably see here. Reducing the amount of trees that you possibly could think of is a great method to make sure that you're on the right track. Uh, you know, once I get into more of the 45 to 55 foot depth of a forest, my mind completely changes if I see any type of understory growth trees, because I can tell you that there's only a certain amount of trees, if I would just look this up in a book, that are going to grow in shady conditions. And, and knowing which trees would be in that area, I, I, I narrow down the amount of time I'm thinking. Yeah, you made uh, mention when we were chatting earlier about similarity from tree to tree. Uh, and, I, and I guess, again, that's probably regional to some degree that you want to have certain species that are similar here on in Virginia, Maryland or Kansas or I guess. Do they have trees in Kansas? I think they do. Uh, I, I think they still do. There's like six. <laughs> yeah, I've driven through quite a quite a few times. They, they do definitely have trees. Um, yes. But I thought that was an interesting concept. You'd mentioned that you you sort of look at these certain number of trees that you know are similar. So maybe you need to be a little more uh, diligent in your analysis. That's, I guess I'm understanding that correctly. Yeah. Um, ones that come up for me a lot that people come and ask me questions are locusts and uh, mulberries. And starting with mulberries, uh, some people think that, uh, you know, mulberries have white fruit. That's not necessarily typical. Uh, white mulberry is the invasive uh, mulberry that we, we see in this area. Uh, the way to figure those out uh, are that they have shiny, bright green leaves, prominent veins underneath the leaf structure. That's much different than the red mulberry. Uh, the red mulberries have dull leaves, and their bark seems a little more, a little more gray than you know. So if you're doing winter ID, you have more of a gray bark with a red maple or red mulberry, but with a, a white mulberry, you're going to have uh, a pinkish brown to it with orange furrows in the bark. Uh, and usually, your invasive is going to be in that disturbed roadside. 
So the moment I walk up to Mulberry and I can't memorize the, the shiny bright leaf, but I, I can, I can realize through the structure, the, the overflowing, the twisting of the bark and the overflowing of the top branches. This is probably a Mulberry. Uh, my mind's going to go to invasive because of the nature and where it grows. Uh, and, and knowing that a native Mulberry, its habit is, is not to grow in cinders alongside the road. So looking at it that way, uh, all about context of where you're standing could help you figure out those trees that are similar that can create an issue issue in the field. Uh, the other one was uh, locust. I have a lot of people asking the difference between black locust and a honey locust. And I think what's helpful is just the bark. As I go back to it, uh, the black locust will kind of have that almost intertwining rope look to it. And the honey locust will just have long, narrow, almost flaky plates. Once you know that that twisting gray intertwining, you know, bark is the black locust, you can kind of throw out those other identifying features because in no way will the honey locust ever have that bark. Um, honey locust also has a lot more thorns, but sometimes when they're younger, you're, you, you may not see them for one reason or another, or you could have an enormous species, which is thornless out there. Um, but, you know, that's what I started finding as, as the easiest thing to do is recognizing the patterns of the bark and what that is through the ages uh, of the tree and, and what type of habit that takes. I, I would say that's what actually was the turning point. Of, of being an average um, landscape architect with, with knowledge of, of trees in the woods to uh, more advanced and, and quicker on the uptake of each tree I'd see there was, was really mastering the bark and, and what habit the tree wants, wants to have. Um, also in reference, if we're talking about the different locusts, you know, the black locust has a simple compound leaf where it's just one leaf one leaflet hooked to, to a stem, whereas the honey locust is bipinnately compound. So it's gonna have a leaflet with many different leaflets on it. So once you're walking up to that road edge or forest edge, you can quickly discern the leaf structure if it's in the summer that you can just say, well, you're not gonna have that with a black locust if it's bipinnately compound, if it's a whole leaflet of leaves. And, uh, and that's an easy thing. but. But once you go through there, you know, that's something you can easily look up and categorize for yourself, you know, as you go home and, and, and you sift through your photos and that just create that that's knowledge that builds upon itself each time you're out. Yeah. It, as, as you continue to explain all this to me, the, the thought that comes to mind is pictures, 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 and good reference books. And, and I, I think so. It, in the beginning, yeah. I don't know enough about different reference books to know a good one from a bad one, but I would think you want to find something that that you know you can depend on. Yeah, uh, in the conferences, I, I gave a few that are just diehards for me, uh, and uh, one of them is that's the the theme of my conversation. It feels like, and I didn't know it was going to go that way. Uh, is uh, is Bark? It's a field guide to trees of the Northeast. And it's by uh, Michael Wojcik, and that is an excellent, excellent book. It's it has ages of bark uh, with a quarter size there, so you can see the different furrow and ridge sizes. Uh, but it will give you the you know younger age, the mature age, and yeah, the middle age of of different bark. Uh, and that's I, I haven't found a book that that does it quite like his book does. Uh, and one that's really old, it's out of print. You can still find it, but this was given to me when I first started. Uh, it's the fruit key and twig key to trees and shrubs. And it's written by, uh, William M. Harlow, PhD. Uh, that book is excellent. It's black and white. It'll feel like you're back in the sixties, but the, the identification, the way you can go through the book, uh, you know, if it has certain attributes, you know, go to page six or page seven, very easy to use and uh, small enough to you can carry it in your back pocket if you needed to, to look at things. Um, and then being a landscape architect, I would say that, uh, you know, if you want the big version of a book that's really going to give you the details, uh, it would be the Manual of Woody Landscape Plants by Michael Durr. 
Uh, Michael Durr is one of those heroes in the landscape architecture field of knowing every single thing about a tree. But having that in your back pocket, uh, instead of Google searching, th those books are going to get you much closer to the identification of it is. If, if you are a new surveyor and, and you're starting, these, these books will help you figure out what those pictures were, if you took a branch home, if you took a leaf home, and it'll get you there. Um, but what I would stress, as I've, I have before, is find the intricate details of those trees that are mature in the forest, either reacting through phototropism or geotropism or different abiotic orders, and characterize them. Look at them and identify what you can see, what pattern you see there, and write that down and then have it the next time you go out there, instead of simply relying on Google images um, or branching Google images, leaf images, uh, I, I think that will serve you so much better than um, than than doing that. So would it would it be safe to assume that gathering all this information and then looking to to identify? You mentioned some some text or some books that you used. I, I guess it's safe to assume that something similar to what you use would be available in other parts of the country for the types of trees there. Oh, sure. Sure. Uh, I mean, the, the Durr book that I mentioned, the, um, the manual of woody landscape plans. Yeah. That, that has all trees. I mean, it is like a thousand pages or so. Uh, you should be pretty good, but, but yeah, yeah. I think, I think uh, none of them are strictly to the Northeast. Okay. So there. Now, now the areas, yeah, the areas I use are, are more for this general area, but I, I think they'll get you in the right place. Right. And you, when we were talking earlier too, you mentioned uh, the whole, what conditions certain trees are more likely to be in. Yeah. Uh, you know, as trees get mature, their, their bark changes, their, their leaves change. and being able to capture that, categorize it, and and move forward with a red maple does this at this age, or you know you get to the hundred year stage, uh, you know that that is helpful to to record and and have that in your back pocket. And I guess one of the things that for the surveyor, um, depending on the, how far apart your or how wide, how broad your your service area is, uh, you can encounter, I'm sure, just the same way you do, all kinds of of different species in 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 those different areas. So, uh, and you might not even go there, but once one time in your life or something like that. So I, I can see we're having um, these tips you're talking about, and even having a, a text that you can depend on can be really important. You know, I, I've been out to many different areas where there's been trees that have stumped me that have grown in an area that weren't supposed to be there. And if if you do run into something like that and you can't break it down to, to a class or, you know, that it's a part of an oak or it's part of a maple, um, taking a twig or, you know, documenting the bark structure itself is, is the best way to do that. You know, there are as I move more into management, there are times that I go out there and I, and I still get, I still get stumped with that and have to take a photo and, and come back and, and look it up through the different resources I mentioned. And there's no shame in the game for doing that because things are completely different out in, especially when you go in an area that you didn't know if it was redeveloped or it used to be a mining operation. And now it's all forested back in, you're going to find some unique stuff. Uh, but but I think the methods that I described will, you know, over time, because it, it's not a one time thing when you go out there. You know, this is if, if you're a surveyor, if you're a landscape architect, you're going to have to get encounter trying to figure out these trees in different uh, seasons. You know, that's going to be your whole career. So I think the idea was, uh, you know, using these types of methods are the fastest way to figure out uh, what these tree species are and to make your job a little bit a little bit faster. Yeah, another thing that you mentioned when we were having our conversation earlier was the fact that you you went to school at University of West Virginia. And I believe you said that West Virginia has maybe more species of trees than anywhere. Didn't you tell me that? 
Yeah, that's what I was told uh, when I was in forestry class because of the where the, the glaciers receded up into Canada. There are some species that I was told that uh, are only in Norway that are in West Virginia. Their botany book is is huge. And, uh, you know, when we would go out on our own outside of the academic, there's tons of hiking trails and different camping and climbing things you could do. You know, you saw species out there that, you know, you thought it was a maple, but it was just a completely different maple. And you found that with pines, too. Uh, it's, you know, going to school there and, and learning dendrology there uh, definitely gave me a one up in, in knowing the diversity of species that that are out there and applying that to to my career. Uh, but, you know, academia only takes you so far until you're in, in the real world and you have to get 150 done in like a, a, a day <laughs> to right, figure yeah. out those trees yeah. in the woods. No matter what your job is, once you get into the, as they used to say, where I grew up in the real world of thunder and lightning, then, then the reality oh, yeah. hits, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's what I was trying to stress in the presentation is that, you know, it's not so sterile when you get in the woods and surveyors know that it's not just an arboretum of a tree seen in a lawn and, and you're going to see that tree do the exact same structure that, that you saw on a Google search. It's not going to be like that. And, and that's really what I was trying to stress is the structure of a tree in the woods. You want to learn and memorize the tree's habit of what it tries to do in the woods. So hopefully after, you know, in the, the presentation that I've done uh, uh, twice now, one virtual this spring, uh, but hopefully your mind has changed a little bit that you're not looking for the prototypical oak. You're, you're not looking for what the what you saw in the book for, for a maple, but you're, you're absorbing what the tree's habits are when they're fighting for sun and they're fighting for light in a mature forest environment. And just opening your eyes to to that instead of simply going back to the the academic uh, book or the features of, of what they show as a maple tree. And I think if you get on that path of identification while you're out there, it's going to become a lot easier because you're not you're not stuck in a silo of of what you need to see for this tree. And I think that that was kind of my intent. And some of the walk in the woods pictures I did was to you know find the new character. That, that you're going to be looking for for uh, a mid-age red oak because you're not going to see it on Google. So take those pictures. Um, you know, look at the branching habit. Write that down and move forward as that that's your new understanding of what an oak looks like in a forest. And that will get you further. That's what I learned. Well, that's really good advice for, for our listeners, for sure. And uh, I know we're about at our typical time limit. So uh, I want to thank you for being with me today. And I don't know if you have one last piece of advice. It sounds like that last thing you said was really good advice. Uh, so I didn't know if there's anything in particular that you might want to leave the audience with. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would just be repeating exactly what I said. Uh, but keep your mind open of what a tree would be when when you're out there of what one would look like. And and really, uh, you know, categorize these trees for yourself. Find what works for you as a pattern that you remember. Don't always try to memorize everything from a book while you're out there because you just can't do it. You know, discover the pattern for the tree for yourself and, and then you'll never forget it. Well, that's very good advice. I, I appreciate that. And thanks for joining me today. I, I sort of got you on short notice, but I appreciate you taking the time to, to spend with me and with our audience to help all of us as we go about our work, have a better understanding for trees and plants. Oh, no problem. This was great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to the Surveyor Says podcast brought to you by the National Society of Professional Surveyors. If you have any questions about today's episode or any other topic, please email us at info at nsps.us.com and we are here to help. Visit our website, nsps.us.com to learn more about our association, the programs we administer and support, our sustaining members, and information about future episodes of Surveyor Says. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, as well as our podcast host, Podbean. And remember, it's a great day to be a surveyor. 